We got a quorum. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to Township West Lincoln Administration Finance Fire Committee agenda meeting number five for Monday, November the 16th. Note to members of the public, due to the efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19 and to protect all individuals, the council chamber will not be open to the public to attend council meeting until further notice. Submission of public comments for virtual attendance. The public may submit comments that are on the agenda or request to attend the virtual meeting as attendees by emailing jshimmy at westlincoln.ca by November the 16th, 2020 before 30, 4.30 p.m. Email comments submitted will be considered as public information and read into the public record. The meeting will be recorded and available on the township's website within 48 hours of the meeting unless otherwise noted. I am the chair for the meeting tonight, Mike Rayner. Number one, due to the efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19 and protect all individuals, the council chamber will not be open to the public to attend standing committee and council meetings until further notice. The public may submit comments for matters that are on the agenda to jshimmy at westlincoln.ca before 4.30 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Comments submitted will be considered as public information and read into the public record. Any member of the public that wishes to attend this meeting will required to contact the clerk by email at jshimmy at westlincoln.ca or by telephone prior to 4.30 p.m. on the day of the meeting. The meeting will be recorded and available on the township's one site within 48 hours of the meeting unless noted otherwise. Members of committee, is there any change in the order of the items on the agenda for tonight? No, well, welcome, William. Uh, disclosure, pecuniary interest and or conflict of interest to many members of committee tonight. Seeing none, let's move to appointments. Item A42-20, Gary Scanlon, Managing Partner and Director, Municipal Finance and Byron Tan, Senior Consultant, Watson and Associates Economics Limited. Water and Wastewater Rate Study and Water Financial Plan. Gentlemen, welcome this evening. And I believe you have a PowerPoint uh, presentation you wish to make. Good evening, uh, members of council. Yes, we do. It's a pleasure to be before you once again. Thank you. Um, I guess, does Roberta, do you set this up or are these gentlemen able to do? They're able to share their screen share. Okay, very good. You may proceed then. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So Byron's going to work the uh, mechanics and I'll, uh, I'll talk to the uh, slides. So can we go to the first slide? <clears throat> so this evening we're going to go through uh, just an overview of the, um, the studies that we've done on the uh, uh, municipality's behalf uh, to do with water and wastewater. First part of it is looking at a forward forecast of your water uh, and wastewater uh, capital needs the operating budget, uh, taking a look at new customers that will be coming on stream <clears throat> and looking to calculate the new water and wastewater rates uh, over a 10 year planning horizon. So council considers obviously the very early uh, part of the forecast, the rest is to identify a direction that um, uh, we would anticipate the um, capital expenditures and the operating budgets and rates will take over time. Um, <clears throat> So we're gonna go through the capital side, the operating side, we're gonna talk about um, uh, the rates. And then um, the rate study is one study that we've done, but there's also a mandatory uh, document that has to be provided to the province and that's called a water financial plan. So I'll touch upon that as well, but uh, the province um, looks to have all municipalities be licensed to run their water systems. And every five years, as part of the licensing process, you have to pre prepare a financial plan, which is basically will be based on the information I'll present tonight. And that plan is one of uh, five different components of um, uh, receiving your license. So I'll go over um, that information as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Byron. Uh, so basically we're gonna look to future capital, which is the infrastructure needs. There's growth related, so that to support new growth in the municipality, as well as uh, replacement uh, infrastructure. We refer to that quite often as uh, you know, life cycle costing. We'll talk about how to finance that, um, and then we'll look to see the, the overall implications on the rates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and again. 
So since Walkerton, if everybody uh, kind of remembers the day when we had a significant event in uh, the municipality of um, uh, Brockton, uh, Walkerton had a, a problem with their well uh, being contaminated and 5,200 people were affected to which uh, seven people died as a result. That initiated uh, really a, 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 not only an Ontario wide investigation, but in, it uh, caught the attention nationally and internationally. Uh, so that arising from all of that, we had all of these um, pieces of legislation which were introduced, which basically guide how a municipality will run their water and the wastewater systems. The Safe Drinking Water Act, which is first on the, the list, it is the major piece of legislation which, which oversees the day-to-day -day workings of the system. It uh, talks about the levels of um, you know, um, chlorination. Uh, it talks about um, you know, having all of the people working on that system trained. It talks about people uh, doing in the laboratories doing the testing. So it's a holistic piece of legislation. Um, there's other piece of legislation. Um, the two that I'll point out is OREG 453. That's the one that uh, basically guides how we put that financial plan together. I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, a little later. So that's the, the formal document we have to send to the province. But then <clears throat> there's a pending piece of legislation called the Water Opportunities Act. I'll summarize that at a high level. But basically the principles on which are uh, set out in that document are really what will guide the way that we've done uh, our analysis that I'll present tonight. The other piece of legislation is the last bullet, which is really a requirement uh, of the province for municipalities to do long-term asset management planning. So look at your assets, especially your core assets like water, wastewater, storm, roads, and then the other assets, but to look at uh, seeing how they're performing, take a look at the age, take a look at um, you know, the, the need to either re rehabilitate them, uh, extend the useful, useful life or replace them. So these are, um, uh, this piece of legislation is in effect right now and um, uh, municipalities are carrying out the, those requirements. I talked about the Water Opportunities Act. Um, the main, uh, there's three different sections of it. The main one is the last bullet point, which is preparing sustainability plans for water, wastewater, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can see they've even introduced stormwater as part of this piece of legislation. Next slide. Um, the sustainability plans really requires you to do a, a more detailed review of how the system's performing and to provide a full plan for addressing the asset replacements and the maintenance of the, uh, the system over a long period of time. And as I say, that's not only for water, but it crosses into wastewater, which is, you know, your sanitary sewer system and storm water. We have the legislation in place, but the regulations aren't there. They're waiting for the um, process, that asset management uh, process that I talked about um, in the last slide. They're waiting for the completion of that to fully roll out the Water Opportunities Act. But I will go through many of those different elements in, in tonight's uh, presentation. The financial plan will include the asset management plan, a financial plan, which is really looking at how you're gonna uh, replace all of those assets. Uh, what's the impact on rates? You know, do you have enough debt capacity to borrow or do you need to stockpile your reserve funds, et cetera? So that'll be part of the financial plan. They require a conservation plan. So ensuring that uh, you're conserving the, uh, the utilization of the infrastructure. Uh, an assessment of risk. Uh, to see if um, in that assessment, what may interfere with your providing the, um, uh, the services, you know, in a, in a comprehensive way. And lastly, to put forth st uh, strategies for maintaining and improving uh, the service. Next slide, please. That infrastructure plan that I talked about, the asset management plan, just to identify some key dates. There'll be, it's already in progress with the, uh, the municipal staff. 
they'll be looking at over the next two years to uh, address the, the plan for water, wastewater, storm and roads. They're referred to as the core assets. And then uh, subsequent to that, to address all the rest of the services. And then to put a comprehensive uh, plan together in totality uh, by 2024. Uh, my discussions with the province, they'd be looking at somewhere over the next two years to three years to start to roll out the requirements with the water and the wastewater through the Water Opportunities Act. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've really, I've just touched on this, but this is just for your information, a little bit more on the timing. Next slide, please. So the starting point, now I'm gonna get into the cal actual calculations or the, the details of the study that we've done. Uh, part of what we look at is, um, you know, your existing uh, customers, the existing rates, and that generates a certain amount of revenue. And then we forecast into the future the additional number of customers that you're going to have, uh, because they will be the ones that will be contributing towards the, uh, the expenditures that we'll talk about this evening. Right now, you have um, uh, roughly 92% of the municipalities uh, that have um, uh, metered water provide for a similar type of um, uh, structure uh, for uh, charging water and wastewater. There's a base charge, uh, basically uh, monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly. You're, you uh, bill on a quarterly basis. So every quarter you charge $39 as a basic charge uh, for the residents or residential. And then on top of that, you charge for the volume that's uh, consumed. So the amount of water that they actually use. Um, so you can see um, we go with um, an increasing charge depending on the type of meter there for the base charge. As the meters get bigger, they're normally moving from residential, which is the smallest uh, number. And then as you get larger, uh, there are different types of uh, businesses. So you can see that the charge increases correspondingly with the, uh, uh, the size of the meter. The volume charge is $1.41 per cubic meter. So it doesn't matter if you consume one cubic meter or a million, you pay $1.41 for each uh, cubic meter of water you consume. And then uh, if you're purchasing bulk water uh, from the municipality, there's a higher charge, $1.90 per cubic meter. On the wastewater side, we use those water meters as well as uh, <clears throat> a way of imposing the charge. And you can see that the base charge for per quarter is $91 uh, for the residents. And then on the volume side, so whatever we read through the water meter, we charge $1.82 per cubic meter being read. And that money goes towards the wastewater uh, service. Next slide. <clears throat> Customer base, you have uh, roughly about 2,437 uh, water customers. You can see the 5 8 meter size, that's the residential. So of your customers, you've got uh, uh, just under 2,400 customers are residential. The rest of the customers are basically your non-residential, so commercial or institutional or even industrial. On the wastewater side, you have a slightly less number of uh, customers that are hooked on. So you've got 11 less customers than, than your water uh, customers. Next slide. <clears throat> when we forecast out, we've been looking at the amount of growth within the municipality. So you can see the existing number of customers is the top uh, table. <clears throat> and then the forecast is each and every year to increase that number based on uh, growth. And that will increase the amount of people contributing towards that monthly, or sorry, that quarterly base charge uh, for water. We've also looked at the average consumption of uh, the customers. And with those increase in residential customers, there'll obviously be an increase in the amount of water that is consumed by those customers. So we have the two components of your, your revenue, the base charge, uh, and then on top of that, the volume charge, which will basically vary depending on the number of um, uh, cubic meters of water that's consumed annually. On the waste, uh, we'd note that uh, the average that we've seen, that we've analyzed is uh, the, the residential customers 
consume on average 161 cubic meters a year. So that's the, the basic midpoint for the, um, uh, for the consumption. This slide shows you the wastewater. You can see we've done a very similar forecast looking at the, uh, the com customers coming on stream, adding that to your existing, and then forecasting the volumes associated with those um, customers. Next slide. The capital, the infrastructure, this is uh, obviously extremely important because this is how we basically get the water uh, and transmit it through the system to the houses, to the businesses. And then when you uh, basically, um, you know, use the sinks, take a shower, use the toilets, the water flows out into the wastewater system. And then that's, uh, that's moved through the system and basically sent to the treatment plants. So we've analyzed over the next 10 years, the capital needs, and we've taken a look at when it's needed, the timing and the cost associated with that different infrastructure. On the water side, actually there's quite an extensive list on the water side. <clears throat> the, um, the top uh, projects here are basically the replacement program. So we're looking at uh, replacing uh, various, uh, the water meters and various pipes uh, we're looking at uh, different studies uh, to analyze the system. Next slide. And then you can see on the next slide that there's a considerable investment in expanding the system to accommodate additional growth. In total, all of the capital expenditures, so for the next 10 years, we're planning to spend about uh, $9.2 million uh, for the system. If you take a look at the timing, you can see a lot of it is towards the front end of the forecast, meaning that we need to have the money in place uh, as soon as possible in order to uh, start to uh, undertake the, this various work. On the wastewater side, next slide please Byron. You can see that in total, we're about $3.3 million. Uh, there's some life cycle uh, associated with, um, you know, some small equipment needs, but the primary driver for wastewater will be um, uh, growth related infrastructure. So upsizing pumping stations, building new water mains, it's, uh, sorry, wastewater mains, et cetera. Next slide. There's not a lot of magic in uh, funding the infrastructure. Uh, if we're fortunate enough to have government programs, uh, grants uh, from the province or from the federal government, that's, that's a nice way to uh, offset uh, some of the costs so that the existing users of the system don't have to pay for it. Right now, there's no active programs uh, that'll uh, help us out. We do hope that with, um, uh, uh, the COVID uh, period that we've been into for the almost a year now, that the province will be coming out and the federal government with uh, some grant programs to help start to stimulate the economy. Um, they did this back 2008-2012 when our uh, friends in the U.S. were encountering problems and uh, it affected the North American economy. So they did, did the Build Canada grant program to help uh, build infrastructure. So we're hopeful we'll see something. Without those grants, then basically the municipality is depending on its own resources. We talked about growth projects. So there, the municipality has a, uh, a specific bylaw, a development charge bylaw. So they do charge the uh, developers uh, who will be hooking up to the water and the wastewater system, a set amount, and that money goes to pay towards this infrastructure. Now, one of the things that is always at issue is the fact that if the municipality builds the infrastructure uh, up front, then you've got to wait for the developments to come along in order to receive the money to basically fund it. So there's normally a bit of a cash flow issue where quite often you have to spend the money in advance and then seek to recover the money uh, later. That does cause some uh, cash flow issues and we'll, we'll touch upon that uh, in some later slides. 
The rest of it basically is to um, either issue debt. Uh, so you debenture it just like a loan, you get a car, you have a car loan and you pay for it over time. Or you try and generate the money from your operating budget. So the, uh, or your day-to-day -day income and either transfer that directly to the capital program or put it into reserves and then draw it out over time. So that's the way we've done it. We've had generating money from the um, from your water bills and your wastewater bills. That money goes into a reserve and then we draw it out over time because the expenditures, as you can see, may be, you know, $3 million in the first year, drop down to, you know, $200,000 the next year and then go back up. So we try and smooth that out by transferring it into a reserve uh, and then try and draw that over time uh, in, a, in a smooth manner. On the next page, uh, <clears throat> with the reserves, we've talked about we are in a positive uh, balance, the capital reserve, so really for replacement or non-growth expenditures out of the development charge. Uh, we've got almost $600,000 and then the development charge reserve, we got about 500,000. On the wastewater side, similar type of thing. We got about 870,000 in the capital reserve and about 650,000 sitting in the development charge. If we move forward, <clears throat> you can see from the $9.2 million we talked about for water, you see the largest component, about 4.3 million, we will draw from development charges. Um, now we've called it the development charge reserve. We may need, as you can see on the prior slide, there's not that much money. We've only got about a half a million dollars sitting in there. And we don't anticipate having enough cash flow uh, to directly fund that capital. So we either need to work on some um, uh, agreements with the developers to accelerate the money, or we might have to issue debt and start to pay for uh, those debt charges from, uh, from the development charge proceeds. Once again, I'll touch upon that in a minute. You can see there's about $1.1 million in uh, uh, debentures that we anticipate issuing, and there's about uh, 3.8 million in um, money that will generate from the water bills into the reserve funds and then fund it from there. On the wastewater side, we don't need to issue debt. We can fund it in between the development charge reserves and the water and the, the wastewater reserves. Uh, I talked about the, the development charge having a deficit. And in 2025, we're gonna run into about a $1.7 million deficit. So there'll be a number of years where that reserve will be in a deficit position. And this is where, as I've noted, we need to perhaps look to uh, find a way to accelerate the payments uh, coming from the developers to help out this, um, this particular reserve and minimize the debt. Next slide. And again, <clears throat> so we call uh, for the existing infrastructure and planning on the replacement of it, we call that life cycle. Uh, it's a common term used in the industry. You can see that the water system with some of the assets that are there, they date back as far as the 1950s. So some of the infrastructure that's in place has been around now for about 70 years. Uh, on the wastewater side, it dates back into the 1960s, so it's approaching 60 years. Uh, infrastructure, depending on the, the quality of the materials, um, you know, the age, how it's been performing, how it's been maintained. We see this uh, infrastructure lasting, you know, perhaps 50 years, maybe as long as 80, 90 years. So when we take a look at some of the infrastructure reaching its, um, moving towards its, uh, the end of its useful life, <clears throat> obviously we have to start planning to replace it. And that's where that legislation is taking us towards, is being financially sustainable, and looking and evaluating your assets and then developing long-term plans. If we take a look at the value that you've invested, you've got about $26 million in existing water infrastructure to get the water into the house, and then another 31 million to get that wastewater out of the house. That translates into about $11,000 per customer for water 
and about approaching $13,000 per customer for wastewater. Keep in mind that the region provides for the treatment, like the water supply and the treatment, and they wholesale it to the municipality. And then uh, when the wastewater leaves, it exits into a regional system. And once again, the region treats the, uh, the effluent. So on top of this uh, $24,000, $25,000 per customer, the region has infrastructure, which probably adds about another $15,000 per customer. So really to get the water in and to get the wastewater out, we're in the range of about $40,000 $40, uh, per customer. So it's quite a capital intensive or very expensive investment to provide uh, clean, safe water and to treat the, um, the sewage. This just summarizes for your uh, information, kind of a bit of a breakdown on where the infrastructure, uh, the components that make it up. Uh, you can see the largest component for the municipality of the 26.4 million. We got a little over 23, 22 million, which is just the water mains. And same thing on the wastewater side, we've got about uh, 31 million and the largest component 19 is for the, um, uh, the sewer mains. Uh, if we take a look at the infrastructure, basically it's suggesting just based on age, uh, we would, it would suggest to replace about $9.4 million uh, in between water and wastewater. Staff obviously annually review the performance of the water system, the wastewater system on water. They're taking a look at waterman breaks. They're taking a look at any problems with with uh, pressure and flows and such. And they've sought to uh, advance a little bit more than just based on age, uh, some of the infrastructure replacement, uh, but slow down on the wastewater side, the, uh, the replacement there. So that's where in total, we've got about six and a half million dollars worth of infrastructure, uh, existing infrastructure that we would be replacing. Next slide. This just gives you a uh, perspective, and this is solely based on aged. And you can see that in the early stages, um, we do have uh, some infrastructure that needs to be replaced based on age, but then on performance, staff are uh, identifying the need to accelerate the timing on some of that infrastructure. So you can see over time, um, you know, there's a considerable amount of infrastructure that will have to be funded and this is where I go back to that asset management plan. The province will be looking towards how do you look at all of this infrastructure and over time provide for its full replacement. On the wastewater side, you'll see a similar type of thing. Oh, however, you can see that uh, a lot of the wastewater assets are moved to the earlier part of the forecast versus the latter part. Next slide, please. The operating expenditures, basically these are the day-to-day -day expenditures that uh, of running the system. So you have um, uh, the, um, we purchase water from the region and we purchase the wastewater service from them for the treatment. Uh, and then we've looked at the infrastructure and basically have provided for uh, the indexing of the, um, the infrastructure. And, Chemicals and utilities over the last uh, uh, five to 10 years have been going in excess of inflation. So we've got them at 5%, we've got 2% for salaries and wages, we've got 3% for other um, costs. And we also have the preliminary estimates from the region on their uh, water and the wastewater uh, rates for um, uh, charging back to the municipalities for the wholesale. Next slide. This is meant to demonstrate <clears throat> how the, um, your water bills or how the, the total budget is gonna be uh, impacted for the municipality over the next uh, 10 years. The blue is the operating cost. So for water, you can see we spend about 1.5 million currently, and that's projected to increase up to about $2.4 million by the end of the 10 years. On the capital side though, Right now, the capital component of it, which is debt charges, transfers to reserves, uh, is only about 229,000, but we're projecting it to grow to about uh, over $900,000. So 
So the, the larger amount of pressure over time is, arises from that capital infrastructure, which once again, the province has put a heavy emphasis on uh, the <clears throat> asset management uh, for the water and wastewater systems. On the next slide, we show a similar type of uh, graph for wastewater. And you can see it's uh, looking at increasing over time as well. We've got about 1.9 million, which is the blue, in current uh, operating expenditures rising to about 3.2. And then with the, once again, the capital related going from about a quarter million dollars up to about $700,000 over the 10 years. So a slight increase accelerating a little bit faster than inflation. Next slide. So when we take a look at the water uh, forecast, this is basically looking at how your, your rates will, are projected to vary over the next 10 years. You can see that currently you um, provide a, um, a, a total water bill in 2020. This is based on the average 161 cubic meters uh, use. Um, the, uh, the total bill is about uh, $375. And the base charge of that is basically 150. And the volume, so your usage, generates about $220. As you can see, the volume charge and the base charge, we projected both of them to increase at about 5% per year. So we'd anticipate that moving from this year at $375, next year your bill would increase to $394 for the year, or roughly about a $20 increase, roughly about $1.60 a month uh, increase uh, for that year. Next slide. On the wastewater side, oh, so the bulk water rate, uh, we've increased as well. So those um, water suppliers that come in with the big trucks and fill up the tanks and then distribute it either to cisterns or use it in, you know, water, uh, you know, um, when they put in sod, watering the lawns and stuff like that, they're going to increase their charge at a very similar rate as um, the rest of the water users. So 5% per year. On the wastewater side, which is the next slide, you can see that uh, for the wastewater, uh, for the first year, 2021, we would need to adjust uh, the, the volume and the base charge by 5%, but then thereafter, the base charge we would project moving at 5% per year, but the volume rate moving at 2% per year. So on average, it would be approximately a 4% increase in the wastewater bill. Uh, and basically going from 640 to 660, once again, it's about $2 a month increase. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Byron. If we look at our rates compared to some of our neighbors, Based on, uh, so the total water and wastewater bill based on 161 cubic meters, you can see the blue arrow is where we're at today. So in total, we're uh, just uh, a titch over $1,000. Uh, and then the recommended rates would see us uh, going to um, about $1,060. Uh, so that would, right now you're uh, in the middle of the pack. And with these proposed rates, you would still be in the, the middle of the pack. And keep in mind that um, next, uh, we these are based on uh, all the rest of the uh, municipalities are based on their 2020 rates. So they don't reflect any proposed changes that will be coming before council in, um, in the early part of next year. Next slide. So um, all of this information, as I say, there's the, uh, what we've presented so far allows us to calculate what the rate or the, the water bills and the wastewater bills um, should adjust on a year to year basis. Uh, for right now, council would be considering 
the 2021 rates and the rest of the rates will be subject to review on an annual basis during the budget process. But we need this information in order to um, provide to the province that water financial plan, which uh, they need to approve. So it's part of your licensing process and we have to prepare a separate document from the water rates. Uh, the current license is set to expire early next year, uh, but we need to have the document to the province um, about five to six months in advance of that so that they can consider it as part of their, their total process. Next slide. This um, plan, they call it a living document because obviously what we're doing today is, is a static document. It's our forecast and we need to have uh, a six year uh, timeline in that financial plan. So obviously moving from one year to the next, things are gonna change. You don't need to refile unless there's a significant, very significant change in that water plan. Um, and then it would be the judgment of the municipality to refile the plan. What this plan is structured right now, uh, in the future, what we presented to you today with uh, probably a more in-depth evaluation of the assets uh, is really where they're targeting in the financial plan identified under the Water Opportunities Act. Right now, they've put in an interim piece of legislation, which is really structured on a financial statement format. So it takes the work that we did here and it translates it into using public sector accounting principles. Um, so it still reflects what we're doing, but it changes the way that uh, the information is portrayed and the way that it's communicated. Uh, so that we will prepare the plan for uh, council and then it will be uh, submitted to the province. And it also has to be filed onto your website for, for people to review. Next slide, please. So um, the plan is right now is only for water. Um, as we've talked about the Water Opportunities Act is gonna look at water and wastewater, but right now this piece of legislation is passed under the Safe Drinking Water Act and it only applies to water. So, uh, but in the future, we'll have to be doing this for both of them. Um, this process uh, doesn't vary from what we've presented today. As I say, they look towards a standardized way of uh, municipalities reporting the data to them, and they've selected uh, this. Next slide. And just to, um, for those accountants in the house uh, to describe the differences, uh, the difference between a rate study, which is really what we do to calculate your rates, is basically on a cash basis. How much do we anticipate needing to spend next year? And how do we generate the money to, to pay for that? When we get into the financial plan and with financial statements, they make all of these adjustments for time periods. They do accrual. They, instead of looking at debt charges, they look at how much are you paying in interest and then a depreciation. So it's a completely different way of communicating the fi uh, finances. Uh, simply, I think to the general public, the rate study makes a lot easier to understand. This uh, financial statement is uh, more for the professional accountants to understand. But for uh, complete disclosure, this is what the differences are. And when you look at the two reports, you'll see that they're significantly different even though they're relying on the same information. So next steps with respect to this process, uh, council will consider uh, obviously the, the capital plan and the operating program that we've provided. Uh, they'll consider the, the rates, both water and wastewater, which arise from the analysis that we did and then seek to um, uh, consider as well, based on that, the financial plan. Uh, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to answer any questions of yourself or members of council.
Oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. You're not, you're muted right now. You're muted. Still muted. Unmuted now. Any members of the committee have any questions? <clears throat> None. We have no questions. I, I have one. Oh, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Just uh, briefly, um, one of the um, responses to the initial outbreak of COVID was to delay the impl implementation of, of a rate increase uh, from about March to, um, I believe it was July. Um, so did that have an, uh, uh, any significant effect on, on the, the, the current uh, forecasts and, 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 and rates that are being proposed or, or um, uh, was that something that, um, you know, we just kind of absorbed somewhere else? Generally, uh, through, through the chair, um, when, when you look at these different components, let's take water, um, if you, uh, if the rates aren't implemented uh, as suggested, or let's say consumption goes down because it's a very wet year, uh, most of your expenditures are fixed. Yeah. So the day-to-day -day expenditures, uh, well, the region's component will vary. So there'll be some variance and there'll be a little bit of variance in let's say hydro. But the largest component of municipalities, uh, water and wastewater budgets are generally fixed. So that means if you're, you have to cover those day-to-day -day expenses, what ends up uh, being impacted is the transfers to, the, to your reserves. So if we're planning to build up the reserves to replace that infrastructure, it just means that you've drawn down on the amount of money that's available, which may mean you'll have to go out, you either slow down your capital program or you have to go out and debenture, so issue more debt in order to, uh, to adjust for that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Any other members of the committee have any other questions? Seeing none, Mr. Scandal, Mr. Tang, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to request for address, address items on the agenda. Procedure bylaw section 10135 general rules. One hour in total should be allocated for this section of the agenda and each individual shall only be provided with five minutes to address their issue. Some exceptions may apply. A response may not be provided and the matter may be referred to staff. Are there any members of the public present who wish to address any items on the Administration Finance Fire Committee agenda? Roberta, is there anybody in the wings that wish to speak? I don't believe we have any, Chair. Okay, very good, thank you. Moving on, consent agenda items. Note, all items listed below are considered to be routine and non-controversial and can be approved by one resolution. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests it, which case the item will be removed from the consent resolution and considered immediately following adoption of the remaining consent agenda items. Item A43-20, consent agenda items. Recommendation that the Administration Finance Fire Committee hereby approve the following consent agenda items. Number one, Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, minutes of August the 13th, 2020. Two, West Lincoln Public Library Board Minutes, September 18th, 2020. Three, West Lincoln Public Library Board Minutes, October 23rd, 2020. Four, Information Report, T24-2020, October 2020 Budget Status Report. Five, Information Report, WFLD-16-2020, Monthly Update, October 2020 and six recommendation report, CAO-09-2020, Christmas break, holiday hours. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Mayor Bilsma and second by Councilor Yonker. Recommendation that the administration hereby approve the following to times. Items one, two, three, four, and five be in hereby received for information and that item six be in hereby received and the recommendations contained therein be adopted with the exceptions of any items. Does any members of the committee wish to pull any of these items? Council Riley? I'd like to pull three and four. Three and four, any other members of committee? Okay, moving those three and four aside, one, two, five, and six 
All those in favor? That one's carried. Let's move back to item number three, Council Riley. Uh, we need a mover and a seconder on this. No, oh, I'll move it. All right, and second by Councillor Ganand. Uh, Council Riley, you wish to speak on it? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess through you to uh, the library's CAO, um, I, I had a question um, regarding the minutes of the October meeting. Uh, and so um, out of curiosity uh, during that meeting, I don't know how many people got a chance to go through all those minutes, uh, but a tablet got, the screening tablet for the uh, community center, um, I guess was stolen. And so one of my questions is, um, I realize I, I have, being in the library at least once during the pandemic. Um, I think I just had to give my name and my phone number. Um, I can't recall what other personal information I had to provide, but is any of that information that from the public um, now accessible to whoever stole the, uh, the tablet? Yes, Hi there. So through you, Mr. Chair, to you, Councillor Riley. Uh, no, it's not. Um, and so before I proceed, I just wanted to say that we have gotten the tablet back. So we were able to look at footage um, and the police did an investigation and they were able to recover the tablet. So that's great. Um, but the way it actually works is so when someone goes in and enters their information onto the tablet, immediately that information information is sent to the township who stores that um, and it goes to the clerk's department and also um, the fire chief if there are any issues like any anyone answers positively to a question so as soon as they hit submit the tablet is like wiped clean and it's ready to go for the next person so there's no way um, anyone who's coming in to use the tablet or if they were to take it um, could have access to any of that information okay thank you and that's reassuring <laughs> Like information and filling it out uh and so i was just kind of curious whatever information it was you know where that was so it's great to hear that that was recovered uh my second question uh through you mr chair back to the library ceo uh and so during that same meeting there is i guess a discussion about i guess resistance still from the community with compliance to wearing a mask when entering the facility and so i i guess my question is um trying to understand what is currently in place are we um given the nature of everything are we still allowing the uh the uh, i guess the uh uh residents or whoever the citizens who are coming into the community center um entry if, even if they don't show up without a mask or are they taking the mask off once they're inside i'm just trying to figure out where the resistance is and why they're just not being turned away at the door as we offer curbside pickup so it's not like they can't participate with it so i'm just trying to get clarity of where the mask issue is uh falling Right. Um, so through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to you, Councillor Riley, once again. Um, so we do have uh, an opening plan for the library and the township does as well. And through that, um, also in correlation with the provincial regulations and regional regulations, people entering the facility do have to wear a mask. However, there are some exceptions, such as medical reasons, and of course, children under the age of two. So um, if so, they are coming into the facility not wearing masks. And in the case that they stay not wearing a mask, it's because they've declared a medical exception. Okay. And so I guess back to you, Mr. Chair, just at the library seal. Um, and, and maybe even to our, our mayor or, you know, I guess our regional councillors on this meeting, um, getting some clarity in the regional bylaw, because I guess the impression I was under was, although it was an exemption, it didn't automatically guarantee entry as long as there was some kind of alternative um, option available to still serve the, the individuals. And so I guess maybe I'm just seeking clarity of, in the bylaw itself, um, why somebody, you know, who may have a medical condition, which is unfortunate enough, um, but why they would still be able or granted the option of entering, um, risking, you know, whoever else is in the facility or even hundreds others, um, risk of exposure. Uh, so maybe through you, Mr. Chair, to the, the mayor, I don't know if he could elaborate a little bit how, how familiar he is with that bylaw, uh, but is, that, am I, is my understanding of that correct? Or is that bylaw, um, it, it, if you just declare you have a medical condition, you have a free pass? So this, there's um, the simple answer for that is 
Yes, the Niagara region did develop a bylaw that allowed for people to enter premises without being asked if they um, uh, had, a, had a, a medical condition and, and they, they wouldn't have to be questioned further. And, and that was kind of a privacy issue. Now, the wrinkle is that since then, the province has put in their own mask bylaw. And uh, I, the, the way that they, uh, our municipality has been operating is that uh, the provincial one carries more weight and supersedes or, or uh, uh, because uh, the, for example, um, as, as CAO from the library, uh, Vanessa mentioned that uh, two-year-old, uh, two-year-olds um, was the age where the mask was required and, and the original municipal one done by the region was five years old. So it gives you an indication of wh where the adjustments have, uh, have taken place. So uh, as to the best of my knowledge and in, in the meetings that I've attended with uh, the EOC and, and, and um, uh, in discussions with uh, um, uh, our staff and, and uh, we're operating under the provincial one to the best of my knowledge and anybody uh, on staff is able to uh, correct me on that. But uh, Okay, thank you. Um, like again, like I, obviously, I think we can all agree no one enjoys wearing a mask, but it's the law. So I'm just trying to figure out, um, you know, what protection our staff have if you know if this was an area that needed clarification. So, anyways, I think I got my answer there. Thank you very much. Any further questions regarding number three? That was moved by Council Riley and second by Councilor Ganan. Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Now. Councilor Riley, you also wish to pick number four. So you move number four. We need a seconder for number four, please. Again, Councilor Ganan. Councilor Riley, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I often pull this one. This is kind of my my uh, my monthly poll here. So I'm going to go through you to the um, uh, Director of Finance. Um, I just, again, trying to give the community who may be tuning in later on YouTube a quick brief of, uh, of the status report here. Um, and I do have one question, which I'll, I'll throw in here too. Um, I see just at the bottom here, um, it's talking about, um, oh geez, well, my screen just moved. Uh, I saw a number change. And so I was just trying to figure out if the projection of originally, I think it was close to three quarters of a million dollars, if that has changed or if I'm missing something. Uh, looks like it was down to 597. That's the number that comes to mind. I'm just, my screen moved on me as I was clicking around here. So maybe um, I could get an understanding of what the inefficiency um, mark was. Oh, it's five, I, 531, maybe. So anyways, let, uh, let the director speak and maybe she can provide some clarity. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Riley, through you, uh, Chairman uh, Rayner. Um, so the monthly update that is presented to Council um, does change every month because the analysis is done each month and um, estimates can change because um, you can tell there's a column for um, actuals, but there is a column for estimates and also actions change during a month. So I'll draw your attention to some adjustments that were made in October versus um, the previous months that council saw. Um, one of the things that we did was we provided um, an additional grant to two hall boards, um, Kester Hall and Wellland Port Hall. Um, it was a matter of um, an emergency because they were running out of funds. Um, those halls, although they're owned by the township, they're run by the hall boards and the halls are responsible for paying um, all the utilities for those uh, facilities. Um, due to COVID, they weren't able to have um, any rentals. So it was necessary to give them some assistance. So that's a new number, um, 7,570. That was never in any projection previously. Um, it's something that's happened quite recently. Um, in terms of the second question you had, Councillor Riley, about the um, embedded costs related to COVID. Yes. And that is uh, reviewed every month and there was a slight adjustment. The new projection is 697,900. And I believe the last report was closer to seven. And that's just a matter of looking at the time that um, staff has spent dealing with the emergency and some figures were adjusted. Not a huge adjustment. No, and, and thank you. It was actually sick. You're right, 697, not 597. Um, and so that's, again, me just trying to figure out how the, the measurement works. Um, and it actually, and I, and I think Councilor Rayner has asked this in the past, and I'll maybe ask it again. Um, 
like, just trying to get an understanding of how that is calculated. I realize these are based on a bunch of variables and it's an approximation and not an exact figure um, and an estimation because it's based uh, on, you know, staff's time and, you know, what that cost would have been worth. Um, but how is that measured? I don't think I fully ever have actually understood how that's measured. And so I'm going to try to give an, a little explanation of what I think, but I don't think it's exactly like this. But um, is, is there on a daily routine, I, I just imagine somebody's got to check in with somebody and you guys are setting some kind of weekly goal of what you want to achieve. And then is that being calculated based on how much is being achieved during that week um, to determine what percentage we're running at? Like if we're, let's say hypothetically with COVID and everything we're running at, you know, 40% efficiency and of that 40%, you know, staff is running, you know, 75% of that 40% efficiency. Like it, how are we able to understand how that's, how that's being monitored and how that's being calculated uh, through you chairman Rayner to Councillor Riley um, in this report on page um, 63 of the agenda I tried to give a little bit more detail compared to other months as to how these estimate estimates are derived so um, part of the cost is an is an actual amount 166,000 which represents time where um, staff were unable to um, actually physically go to work, we're at home. That was at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, the second part is an estimate of time spent um, by senior management and senior staff. Um, so you can see there's an estimate for the first 15 weeks of the pandemic, March to June, um, about 60% of the time was spent on the pandemic. And then for the latter part, 40%. So that's an estimate. We look at the amount of time spent in meetings um, and we average that out. So that's how the number is derived. Okay, thank you very much for explaining that. Any further questions? Um, I have one for um, the um, Director of Finance. Is there, is there a procedure like goals or objectives that's established with the people who are not in uh, the office um, and, and measured every week to determine um, what level is being accomplished? Um, are, are we getting the same amount of work done at home as we are at work or is the percentage less, for example, are they doing like three quarters of what they used to do if they come here, but they're doing 100% of the three quarter or are they doing the equivalent amount at home and there's a way to measure that, that it would be the same as if they're at work. Uh, through you, Chairman uh, Rayner, I'll, I'll address it and then the CAO, CAO may want to add some comments as well. Um, so at the beginning of this pandem pandemic, um, we looked at different technology that would allow people to work from home and also work in the office. So we um, purchased a system that lets people log in from home um, and it's like they're at their desktop at work. So in terms of ability to work, it's, it's quite seamless. Um, managers and directors check on their staff to make sure work's getting done. Um, it, Every department has its own deadlines and its own reports that have to be accomplished. If, if those aren't being done, then you would know that staff aren't working. Um, in terms of some departments, um, right now, a lot of staff are in almost full time. Um, there's some people still working from home, but I can say frontline staff are in probably almost 100%. And um, I can speak to my department. They're, they're in about three days a week with some staff still working from home. Um, but I don't think there's been an issue with any type of um, goal not being reached or staff not working. Um, but of course, I, I, I look at it from a finance standpoint. Um, so perhaps the CEO wants to add on to that. Um, Madam CEO. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, and to the, our Director of Finance, she did a, a very fine um, job answering the question. Um, but what I can, I'm going to add a little bit to it. And I can tell you that it has been incredibly seamless there, whether you we are working from home or from the office for our customers, they really don't um, see the difference in the level of service. We um, have determined, and, and one of the things that COVID has done is has really increased our creativity and, um, and our agility in terms of, of meeting different sorts of um, work situations. 
where the director of finance has commented on the fact that a lot of people were back in the office with the change in the um, the situation that is happening with the increase in the number of COVID cases, we're actually looking at going back to more, looking for opportunities for people to work from home more so that we're reducing the number of people in the office. And this is a directive that has been coming from public health and we are following that directive and, and um, having um, complete regard for that, that responsibility that we have as an employer. Thank you. Madam CAO, if I can further ask a question. Last month, I asked you a question about the efficiencies of the working and you said 100%. Um, if it's 100%, does that mean that the workload that they're doing now is consistent with the workload prior to COVID? Councilor or Chair, I think it's a, I think that is accurate. Um, I'm going to tell you, though, that our workload and, and it gets to this productivity number that is in our reports regularly. A lot of us are doing double duty. So quite frankly, we're, we're work, working more than 100 percent. We are working, um, doing our regular business plan and taking care of the, the uh, items that are required to to meet the objectives that we set with our budget and with our strategic plan. But on top of that, we are managing in an emergency situation. After eight months, we are still meeting regularly. We are doing the um, emergency operations center every week. We are, are meeting with recovery, uh, the recovery team to, to um, figure out different ways to respond. So our, it, it has been a, a very, very, very challenging work year. And I think that council should be very proud of the fact that there are, all of our customers are being served the best that they can be. And if we can't do something for them um, online, we have, we have figured out many different ways to, to, to do service, whether it be meeting them in the parking lot, um, trying to problem or troubleshoot over the telephone. So yeah. Um, have I answered your question or do you want me to answer? Well, no, it's just, um, I, I had a call from, from a constituent just uh, a week ago and uh, he called on Monday and he kept calling and he called and I had to call through and it took till Friday before he got an answer. And um, so oh, I, heard about that situation. I was concerned with, with regards to that. That's why I asked the question with regards to workload uh, because I wanted to know if, they, if there was allocated time in order that we still have the relationship with the taxpayer in this township. And the other fact that I was trying to get to is if they are working at 100%, then bottom line for the township should not be as dramatically affected as one would anticipate because if people are doing 100% of the workload, that means that the income coming into the township would still be consistent because we haven't felt the effects of the COVID as far as the amount of productivity that's being put out from, from staff, which means our bottom line should be closer than we're seeing right now other than the time that's used to, to attend COVID meetings, which takes away from productivity, but workload from staff does not appear to be affected. Am I not correct on that? Um, so there was a lot in that statement there, and I'm going to try to parcel it out. Um, so I did hear about that one incident with the person who had made reached out to you, and what had happened there was um, the call was redirected to the um, incorrect staff members, so we had a bit of a breakdown, but staff have regrouped to figure out how to handle that better in the future. Fortunately, that's just one, one issue that we, has been brought to our attention, so that was one. Um, in terms of um, our effectiveness, it's not totally um, apples to apples, so looking at 2020 to 2019, because of our our revenues and our services is particularly re related to recreation are have changed significantly, but that work has changed because we spent a lot of time trying to communicate the new rules and responsibilities that we have in terms of responding to the provincial um, requirement, provincial and, and uh, uh, local public health requirements. So it's different. And then your third point, um, Actually, and I would also say that um, the report that our director of finance does every month is, is very, very, very comprehensive. And we have a very good record now of what and how our, our work and our finances have, have changed over the course of the year. We're doing quite well and we monitor and we talk about these things very, very regularly. Um, 
and uh, there was one more point that I will have, probably have to listen to the tape to re respond properly, or you could remind me right now. Um, no, the, the last point was that um, I'm looking at it that if you're saying that 100% is being utilized by staff right now, which means that our workload is consistent with prior to COVID, then our bottom line should not be dramatically affected because we're not slow at getting permits out or we're not delayed in doing uh, uh, follow-up inspections on, on uh, housing projects or whatever the case may be. So what I'm saying is that hopefully this is not going to affect the bottom line as dramatically as I've heard other municipalities have because all of a sudden uh, you can't get a hold of anybody. You can't get permits. What used to take a month to get a permit it's taken three months. Um, we're not in that state uh, uh, based on the fact that you're telling me that, that staff are working at 100%, which means the level that we're getting things done to service the public in the township of West Lincoln is consistent prior to COVID as it is now, um, barring a few other changes, obviously. But um, based on those numbers that you told me, it appears that we're not hindering the performance and the efficiency of this township as severely as other municipalities because of COVID. Am I reading that correctly? Well, I, I'm not going to speak to my knowledge of every how every other municipality is doing. We're really paying very close attention to our own bottom line. I understand, and, and that's what I'm referring to as our bottom line. Um, so you, you, we're, we're good, we're strong. We're, if we've got applications coming in for, for builds, whatever the case, we're on it almost to the same level we were prior to COVID. Is that what you would say? I, 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 I generally think so. Um, if we, we, if people are coming in and going through the permit process, if people aren't going through the permit process, we don't know about that. Right. And we have to then go and do things sort of based on a complaint basis. So, okay. um, yeah, if you look around, like the number of, of permits that are coming through in uh, the, the buildings that are going on, it, we're, we're doing well. All right, because the bottom line was showing a $700,000, and I mentioned before, it looks like we're off the rails, we're heading towards the train wreck, but a lot of it was the time consumed but attending these meetings that were the non-productive time to getting to, they weren't attributing to the bottom line is what no, I was saying. I I think that that was a bit of a confusion through the basically from May through till now, and we're, we've been trying to clarify that. Um, the report speaks to uh, where we are in terms of uh, the bottom line finances, which are, is not near that $700,000 mark at all. Okay, one other further question um, to the CAO. Um, we tend to follow a lot of things that the government does, obviously, because as the mayor mentioned, we're mandated down from the province. Um, I like to keep more open and I'm sure other council members would like the opportunity down the road that we can get back in the council chambers because this is not near as enjoyable, at least to me and a few others have said the same thing as being back in the council chambers and hopefully down the road this will happen. But as it exists right now, for example, the license bureau in town, um, the people are lining up and you can go in. I've been to the massive one down on Barton Street uh, in Hamilton and there's a there's hundred people out there. Uh, and yet we still have the doors closed here. Um, we do have the screening up like they have in the license bureau. Uh, we still mandate wearing a mask, which they do going into the license bureau, even though the people behind the counter, the license bureau do not wear a mask and um, their screening, their, their, their plexiglass does not appear to be that great. But why don't we open the doors and allow the people to come in as the license bureau does because the government says that's acceptable and kind of open the welcome wagon door a little more for people to want to come in and want to talk to staff, still respecting the safety rules, uh, which the government says is acceptable for a licensing bureau. Well, thank you for the question. I don't think I know their, their operation of the license bureau as, as actually I really have no clue what their protocols are, except for I do know that I see people standing outside on the sidewalk and that means that they have to only go in when a certain number of, of space is, is available. So within our, our township office, we know how many, what our capacity is so that you can maintain a safe distance and make sure that they, everyone will be able to get their two meters for social distancing. And that's exactly what they're doing in the, the license bureau. People have to stand outside. We have done it by appointment only. People make phone and they make appointments and they're able to come here and to set up a meeting and to talk one-on-one -on -one as they need to. We try to do more things over the telephone. We try to do more things by our website. 
in terms of sharing information. So we, we aren't, we're, and as a matter of fact, we have gone back and we're more strongly communicating our message about being appointment only. And we're doing that to protect our residents and to protect our staff. It's just that the License Bureau, they found what they were doing was acceptable. And I'm just wondering why we're not following since it's provincially mandated. So if we did open the door, there would be no objections from the province because they've already done it on other areas of their services that they provide for, for people in Ontario. Yeah, that the, every every organization has to look at their own their own business model and and way of, of doing things. Don't forget that the license bureau was um, giving or extending people's ability to renew their licenses, their permits, everything for a very very long time. And as a matter of fact, you can continue to do that, but people for other for other reasons need to get in there and they have to line up. Yeah, you know I agree. I agree. All right, I don't have any further any further questions from any of the members of the committee. All right, that number four was moved by Council Riley and second by Councilor Ganan. All those in favor? Okay, that is passed. Thank you. That now finish the consent agenda items. Item number A44 20. Fred Viudavine, Niagara Pallets, re request the township to forgive interest on late payments of fees for peer review of site plan agreement. Recommendation that the correspondent receive from Fred Viudavine. Niagara Pallets dated November 6, 2020, requesting the township forgive the interest fee for late payment of fees for peer review of their site plan agreement, as it is felt that the township's policies should give businesses a longer interest-free period to provide time to review invoices in order to confirm the amounts and that the businesses be given at least 90 to 120 days to pay invoices be received and so it's just to be received. I need a mover and a seconder then, please. Councilor Riley and Mr. Mayor, any further questions at this point? It's just to be received. There it stands. All those in favor? And it is to be received only. Thank you. Staff report, item A, 45-20, Treasury Director of Finance, Donna DePolifis, recommendation report, T-25-2020, Water and Wastewater Systems Rate Study and Financial Plan, recommendation one, that report T-25, Dash 2020 dated November 16, 2020 regarding the water and wastewater systems rate study and financial plan be received. And two, that the water and wastewater systems rate study and financial plan number 077-301 as attached to this report prepared by Watson Associates Economist Limited be accepted. And three, that the water and wastewater systems rate structure and rates recommended in the report prepared by Watson and Associates Economist Limited be approved. And four, that the 10 year financial plan as required by the Safe Drinking Water Act regulation, Ontario Reg 453 07, as outlined in the report attached, be approved. I need a mover and a seconder for this, please. Mr. Mayor and Councillor Ganand, any questions from members of committee regarding this report? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Item A46-20, Treasurer Director of Finance, Donna DePolifis, Recommendation Report T-26-2020, Asset Management Risk Framework Assessment. Recommendation that Report T-26-2020, Regarding Asset Management Risk Framework Assessment, dated November 16, 2020, be received for information. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Trombetta and Councillor Yonker, any questions for members of committee on this item? Councillor Yonker, did you have your hand up? No, all those in favor? It's carried, thank you. Item A-47-20, Clerk Joanne Shimmy, re-recommendation report C-08-2020, Corporate Flag Policy. Recommendation one, that the report RFD-C-08-2020, dated November 16, 2020, regarding corporate flag policy be received. And two, that council approve the proposed corporate flag policy and community flag raising request form attached to schedule A and B, and three, that council delegate authority for approving or denying requests for community flag raising requests that have been previously approved or denied by council within the last five years of the request date to the clerk. And four, that the township flag policy adopted in 1987 and the policy for lowering flag to half mask approved in 2004 be and here are hereby repealed. I need a mover and a seconder for this, please. Councilor Riley and Councilor Ganand, uh, it is open for discussion from members of committee. Councilor Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
So I, I had to do a bit of research on this. I went to check out the Grimsby flag policy as well as Lincoln and the Niagara region. I think what we have is pretty close um, comparison to all of those. Um, what I, I did have, and I, I guess maybe um, it threw you to uh, the clerk, uh, Joanna Shime, um, is an understanding and why. So maybe I should explain this first. So one of the questions I asked some of the councillors in Grinsby and Lincoln is um, when a request come in, how does their municipality handle it? And so the, the answer was that they actually don't even vote on it. Um, it's basically just received as information and as an invite only. Um, however, we have a, a voting mechanism. And so I'm wondering why we can't have something similar. So if we have a policy that passes tonight and a request comes in that complies with the policy, why does that need to go to council um, in any capacity? And, and should that just be a situation where if someone doesn't meet the policy, then should that applicant still in insist on trying to fly their flag, um, could they just not insist on having that brought to council? So I'm just wondering if we can get some understanding of why this is set up the way it is. Clerk Shimmy, you have an answer for that, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Rayner, through you to Councillor Riley. Um, I guess my, th my thoughts were the fact of everyone is aware, we're transparent and open to all of members of council what those requests are. And that we are, um, and there, and you're well aware of them, and when they're happening. So that was my thought process, and bringing them to council at least once every f five years. Uh, so you're, yeah. So you're just, you're well, you know, you know what's going on and what where we, what we're actually approving. Okay, because what we had before was more of like it was just like for information only we never had to vote or approve anything now we actually have to prove of something and so i'm just even looking at is you know one extra piece of red tape um in an area where someone if someone's fully compliant why does that step need to happen so i don't know um if this is a, an appropriate place for it but i would be uh inclined to offer an amendment so that that change could be made so we don't have to deal with you know um i don't know 30 i doubt it'll be this much with 30 or 40 flag raisings every time you know this you know someone wants to apply especially if they're fully in compliance with the policy uh you know to me it just seems like you know waste of staff's time and waste of council's time um if they're in compliance so i i don't know um i guess we can wait and see how conversation happens here but i would be inclined to add that amendment uh if possible all right other members of committee have any comments on this uh councillor ganane Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thought it was an excellent policy. I, I don't mind um, if only information comes to council. So if that amendment goes through, that's fine. But I very much like how thorough the report was. I, I think that the using the flag at the community center is a wonderful way to uh, solve the solution of flying other people's flags and not affecting the flags that are flying at the township offices. Um, mm. I, I, I was really impressed. I think that um, our clerk did an excellent job putting that report together. Okay, anybody else wish to comment? Uh, Councilor Trimbetta. Yeah, I'm okay with the policy as well, as well as the, uh, you know, Council Riley's amendment. I, I do agree that, you know, doesn't need to come to council for every decision to be made to, on this flags. I think our clerk and our staff is well capable of doing uh, these things. So uh, again, it, it's a good written policy. It's a lot of work went into it. So I, if that wants to be amended, I don't have a problem with that. All right, anybody else? All right, uh, Council Riley. then, would you like to go to uh, our so, clerk and have it written the way you'd like absolutely. it? Absolutely. So just one more thing I realized, I had another note here I missed in my, my scribble of writing here. Um, and so to you, Mr. Chair, to, um, well, maybe I'll just mention this first so we can figure this out. So one of the other ideas I had, because I, I noticed with, um, what we experienced this year was a lot of concern that a flag had to come down to put another flag up. And so one of the things that I would at least, um, I think support would be installing a fourth uh, flagpole at the community center that could be specifically for flag raisings. Um, and instead of having to worry about the um, any ill feelings towards someone watching the township flag being lowered to put another flag up. So again, I don't know if this is really the appropriate place to put that in if that should just come at budget time. Um, I imagine there, you know, I can't imagine it being less than, you know, a few bucks to say the least. And so I just think that that's something we should consider um, maybe 
again, I don't know if this is the right time for, I realize it's the right time to talk about it, but I don't know if it's the right time to include that in this um, particular situation, but I did want to put that out there that I would support uh, a fourth flagpole and that way nobody has to worry about um, the concerns that could be perceived by lowering one flag to put another as if one's more important than the other. Uh, so anyways, I did want to mention that. And then as far as my motion, I, you know, yes, please, I'll put that forward to the clerk uh, that um, and I'm not too sure how to word it. Uh, so uh, Joanne, please help. Uh, but I imagine it'd be along the lines that um, we, we would that all flag requests that are in compliance with flag policy um, would be give, sent to council as being received and are inf informed or information only. And then I think we need a part that also identifies, you know, should, should there be one that's not in compliance if the, um, people who are should requesting. Be one that's controversial, you were saying? Should be one controversial? Well, I don't even, it has to be specified controversial. I think it's anything that's not in compliance with the policy. That's the only time it's going to, um, which I guess to some extent may be controversial in itself. But if it's not in compliance with the policy, then they have an option to appeal that to council and the council at the time, and I'm thinking down the road, um, can have you know the chance to review and say, hey, you know, we'll allow this or nope, the policy speaks for itself. All right, well, Joanne's working on that. Councilor Yonker, you like to say something? Yeah, I guess I was just gonna ask um, that the first point that Councilor Riley brought up, is that um, in in 4.7 that, that you're having that concern that it goes to council? So, yeah, so hold on, let me just bring the, uh, I, I got, I, had, I went based on my notes, I don't have it in front of me, hold on one second. There was, I know there's a couple points. I know one came, there's the poll from council and then there was another one. Um, so I don't think it was, 4.7 because I think that's specifically relating to months where we have reduced meetings. Uh, where is it? You still think it's 4.7, Council Yonker? Yeah, like he was saying that it's going to go to council or something. That's I, I can't find where he's talking. There was, and it might have been on the, uh, let me bring up the other window uh, uh e-scribe so if you have the just the agenda open it's on e-scribe yes i'm just bringing up where is it background okay so i think it's under the first um actually under the uh the report and i think it's under community flag raising requests uh is it still Sorry, I guess I probably should. I think it's under, uh, sorry, through you, uh, Chair Rayner, to Councillor Riley. I believe it's under sec section 4.2 of the policy. Can you read it, Joanne, please? When a community flag yeah. raising request is approved by council, so I think it's referring to the fact that it's approved by council, the community flag will take the place of the township flag for the allotted duration. Yes, so it's four, that's 4.2 is where I picked that up from. Yeah, it's not r real clear, but it, it it's uh, indicating that, yes, it's you're correct. Right now, what we have is, um, it was before we were just received as information, and I guess if someone had a concern or for whatever reason um, wanted to speak to it, that would just be brought up at that time, or this here, we're actually having to pr approve the request. So I don't think we need this. I think, as you know, Councillor Tremetta said, um, if we have, you know, I'm very supportive of the staff were able to verify that it, it's compliant with the policy. And so that's the, the part I'm trying to um, just expedite so we don't or expedite there so that we don't have to um, worry about having to bring every request that may come down the road. You know, right now it's just a few who knows if there'll be more. But again, this seems this whole thing is everyone else has said this is an excellent report and it seems to incorporate um, what we, our neighboring municipalities have as well as the region. I think right now. Um, having this where it is, um, just having that that little amendment there is just gonna make it that much better. You're right with that, Councilor Yonker. Okay, Councilor Trombetta. 
Can we just remove section 4.2? Uh, Councilor Ganane? I think the 4.2 portion that could be removed is just when it says it's approved by council. It could just simply say when a community flag raising request is approved, the community flag will take the place of the township flag for the allotted duration. I think the intent of that was more about where the flag was going to go and on which flags pole it would go. Um, so if you just took out the approved by council, that might satisfy part of that. And that would just be a housekeeping amendment to the policy. Uh, the, the second portion deals with in 4.7, it deals with the, in the event that a request for a community flag raising is not submitted in a timely manner. And so that goes on to say what would happen if it didn't come in a timely manner. So um, I think that becomes part of the issue. It's not so much about those meetings, but those meetings are an example of a, a time when it might not be timely. So if, it, if the intent is to have council vote on every flag raising, then we wouldn't need such a strict policy. I think the fact that we have a strict policy should preclude the fact exactly. that we would have to vote on everyone. So only the anomalies would have to come, I would think, if ever. Right, Councilor Trombetta, you want to follow up? Yeah, I think, you know what, to be honest with you, because there's so many approved by councils and where it's confused, I think the one I did see, which I, which I didn't really like myself, was the section under 4.5, number one, complete the flag raising request online, fill out the required fields of the flag raising request form. Once completed, the request is submitted to the clerk's department, will be forward on, forward on to council for approval. I think that is the one that is, you're probably referring to bill, not section 4.2. So yes. I, think, I think that needs to be- Removed. Needs to be removed. Once completed, the request to be submitted to the clerk's department where it will be forwarded onto council for approval. That's what needs to be removed. In my standpoint, I don't know the rest of the council. Council Riley, will that do if we if we have uh, the clerk? Absolutely, and maybe I you know I think it still needs to specify once completed that the requests will be submitted to the clerk's office for approval, and that would allow the township to verify that it's in compliance compliance with uh, the policy. So maybe that would help trim down what uh, we're preparing here. So yeah, if we made that change as well as remove the 4.2 approve part, um, it could say that, you know, it could be presented as information to council, but, um, or if we, like as council can mentioned, maybe we just take rid of that first part of 4.2 and that last part of 4.5. 4.5, yes. Section 4 1, 4 subsection 2. Um, then yeah, I'd be completely fine with that. Okay, uh, Clerk Shimmy, you okay with trying to figure this mess out? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Rayner. Um, what I would suggest is, uh, is just, I, I understand what your concerns are. So I have a resolution. And basically what I would say is I refer it back to me, those two sections, and I'll present you a, a, a really? policy before a council uh, that takes into account um, some right. amendments or the amendments to section 4.2 and section 4.5 of the corporate flag policy. Um, so the resolution I have is that sections 4.2 and sections 4.1 of the corporate flag uh, policy be referred to the clerk to address that any community flag raising requests that meet with the policy be approved without having to officially be officially approved by council and that any requests that may not meet the policy be referred to council as required. What about the 4.5 that uh, Councillor Trombetta just mentioned? I, I did say Sorry, I did say that, uh, Chair Rayner. I said sections 4.2 and section 4.5. I think she just made. I think she said the wrong number. I know what she meant. Oh, okay. Sorry. 4.2. Yeah, 4.2 and 4.5. Okay. But yeah, uh, so, so thank you, Brad. I think I think that'd be great because honestly, if we can just tweak that, um, you know, again, as we said, we're having the policy to take out some of the guesswork, okay. some of the politics. So. Okay, so we want an amendment to that. Councilor Riley, you move it? I do. It's second by uh, Councilor Trombetta. Uh, any further questions on the amendment? All those in favor? All those in favor of the original recommendation as amended now? And that's also carried. All right, thank you. Okay, let's move on to um, item A48-20. Clerk Joanne Shimmy, we recommendation report C-09-2020, options relating to filing the vacancy of the office for one councillor position for Ward 2. 
recommendation one that report number RFD C 09 2020, dated November 16, 2020, regarding the options relating to filling the vacancy of the office for one councillor position for it says ward three, it should be ward two. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, it should. Um, we'll change that to ward two, be received and that the clerk be given direction that the vacancy of the office for one council position for ward two for the remainder of 2018 to, to 2022 term of council be filled through option number as detailed herein. I need a mover and a seconder for this, please. Uh, council Riley and Councilor Ganand. Um, Okay, it's on the floor. Uh, members of committee wish to speak on this? Council Riley? I guess I could start. Um, yeah, this is definitely one of those uh, things that the minute we had to make a decision here um, or realize what was coming down the road, it wasn't really too sure. I think what I thought originally um, has changed over the last um, few weeks, even just with all the stuff that's going on uh, locally uh, and even globally. Um, looking at what we, what the options are and the cost impact. You know, I know originally I was thinking, you know, um, I thought I felt it made sense to, to go to the by-election, um, but looking at a few factors uh, from how much time, once the by-election happens from what we were estimated, you know, it looks like someone, at, you know, whoever the, the winner is can take office around, you know, end of April, beginning of May. And, you know, and then we're right back to, you know, election time, not even a year later, and we're $30,000 in the hole with only a reserve of $36,000 currently. And, and so I think even from a financial perspective, it doesn't really make too much sense. Um, I, I Looking at this too, I was trying to figure out what the council's plan would have been had the seat in Ward 2 come up for uh, grab, say, um, shortly after um, uh, in the inauguration. And would we have considered that as an option as well? Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I understand that, you know, it's a democratic process and I think it's probably the least controversial of them all, but we're in a pandemic and I, I feel, I just, I struggle with the idea of what we could be subjecting staff to. So I would be in favor of um, endorsing the appointment to the runner up. Uh, that individual had a chance to run, you know, lost a very slim margin to Councillor Cody. Um, again, I, I think it's the best of uh, the situations that we're in. It doesn't put staff at risk, doesn't cost, I don't think, uh, to what's been explained here. It's the least cost impactive. Uh, and at the same time, it, uh, it, it's the, the fastest one that gets a representative in that ward that they've are the residents in that ward already voted for. I don't feel comfortable with the uh, appointment um, uh, the appointment by uh, uh, application or, or elected official or whatever it was, um, I was just picking at broad. I just think there's going to be too much, um, I don't know, but I don't think that it will be received well, but I do support the fact that residents of Ward 2 voted for Shelly Ann. And I think, you know, um, had 26 of the 50 people who voted extra for Councillor Cody had voted differently for her, we probably wouldn't be in this situation. So um, I, I don't know what is really required here, if I need to bring that forward or if we're just having conversation first, but I would uh, strongly support the appointment of uh, the runner-up in Ward 2 in the 2018 election. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you wish to speak on this? I do. Thanks. Um, so like there's the two options. Um, you know, I, I think we all have our opinions um, uh, about that. And, and to a certain degree, I, I echo a, a lot of what uh, Council Riley said, although um, I, I do hold, uh, you know, I guess the citizens right to choose a representation in, in, uh, in very high as, as I know that he does, but uh, maybe just put a little bit more weight to that. So, you know, um, I mean, we, I guess I suppose um, maybe this is some uh, advice to you as a chair, um, maybe just put option one on there and we'll, we'll take it to a vote. And if it fails, then we obviously could go to two and we'll just confirm that uh, with a vote of confidence on, on two. Um, you know, having a, a back and forth um, might be, I, and I don't want to cut off the discussion, but I'm just saying, you know, at, at a certain point, we, we, we the quicker we get to a, a vote on this, you know, the uh, you know the quicker we get a resolution. But uh, so that's my thought. Um, I, I'm more I'm more of an option two kind of guy, um, and um, and then we'll just uh, we'll see where it goes. Further questions from anybody? I'd still like to hear Councillor Yonker and then Councillor Trumbetta. Yeah, I I'm uh, <laughs> I, I'm sitting here going, wow, what what do I what think? Do I what do? do I prefer? What's better? And, and I, I tell you the honest truth, I, I'm scratching my head. I was, uh, I'm still not 100% uh, 
comfortable with doing an appointment. I definitely agree with um, Councillor Riley. If we are going to do an appointment, I do think that it would be only fair that we do the um, the appointment of, of um, the person that came in third. And but I do also know that there's people that have expressed interest in running and to just ignore that too, I'm having a hard time with, right? So there's that, it, I, I'm sitting on the fence right now. So I was hoping for a bit of a discussion. <laughs> All right, uh, you may have one next, Councillor Trombetta. Yeah, I was torn as well. Like if there anybody who was kind of pushing and uh, even to get back in the council chambers, it was me too. And if we could go back in there, I would go back in. I was one of them. And, uh, you know, but now that we've been put into category orange and what I'm hearing from, from uh, sort of sources out there that we're going to be moving into category red by the end of the week uh, in the Niagara region, what's next for us? Is that the means that we're going to be in a lockdown? And that's the unknowns we don't know. And I don't want to be, I don't like to say that there's going to happen. I'm always an optimist and hopefully, listen, I want, I want to get back to normal, just like probably everybody sitting around this this in front of this computer, there's nobody wants back to normality more than me. And uh, if we go into a lockdown, then that labors the election even longer. But how, how do we do that? How does somebody, when you're told not to go knock on doors, run an election? And uh, again, I, I was really torn. And I, I, I was, and I, I'm being honest, I was for the by-election up until the state that we were in. And how do we put it on the the, uh, the people going in to go run a by-election? And, and actually staff, how does staff do it? If staff's not able to come to work, how do they do it? So those are just my thoughts. I, I, I don't believe in too much of the appointment process by application. And the reason is, and I'll be speak frankly, there's many past uh, people that were sat on council, many people that I have a family member that sat as a mayor for three terms and and two terms Wh whose application is better than than the other and i'm not i don't want to be to determine who that person should be or not be uh as an application uh sense because uh, uh, you know there's many people out there that are are, are applicable but I, I i don't think that should come down to me to decide the people did the you know the the people did vote for shelly uh, bradrick and uh and like I said, I would have went to a by-election, but under the circumstances, I think we're kind of tied in the sense that I, I, I would probably just appoint uh, the next person in line, which was uh, Shelly. And uh, at this point, unless something changes <laughs> very, very soon, I think that's where I stand by. So those are just my comments for the record. I don't know how everybody else feels, but. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Councillor Ganand, you're next. Okay, I'll weigh in as well. Obviously, I support a by-election normally because um, in 2016, that was how I got involved. And uh, probably a few months before that by-election announcement, I hadn't given a whole lot of thought as to whether I would run for council or not. But once I decided to do that, then, um, you know, I began a whole process of knocking on doors and talking to people and finding out what they cared about and what their concerns were. And so I would welcome that other than COVID. Um, based on, on the situation now, all of the good things that I saw coming out of running in a by-election, um, getting up to speed, um, wasn't quite as long into the term. I, ha I have had a bit more time than what um, any new person now coming in would have. But still, having that opportunity to talk to people, find out what their concerns and their, um, their fears and their worries about the township and the direction we're going and so on, um, are I, I, that's invaluable. Uh, but that can't be done under these circumstances. You can't knock on doors. You can't talk to people closely. You can't gather people together. And so I think we need to look at the most efficient way of moving forward and having the people of Ward 2 represented fairly. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have a comment. The fact that uh, I enjoy knocking on doors. I enjoy talking to people. And I don't think in this particular case, people are scared. And if you, you go out, you knock on the door and they see you, they're worried, um, you may have something or you may spread something. So there's a lot of uncomfortableness out there. So it's not the same, it's not the same feeling. You can't get the same enthusiasm because you know you don't know what the reaction's gonna be when they open the door. Um, and um, Shelly Ann lost by only uh, 53 votes. So they were very close. Uh, and if we went through the system as our clerk indicated last month, uh, it would be May 
uh, before this, and when there's only a year and a half left and we're right into election again. So uh, in these circumstances with the COVID, I think it's making it extremely difficult for anybody to want to go out there and participate and really get involved and enjoy it because we're all scared and worried that we're going to either spread it or get it from somebody else. And it's just going to make it a totally uncomfortable situation. I just hope this whole thing's resolved in a couple of years for those who want to go back out again and for those who want to try that we don't have to go through what we're going through right now. So through to the clerk, um, could you please read option one? so that everybody can hear it clearly, and then we'll vote on it. Uh, through you, uh, Chair Rayner, to members of the committee. So the um, the resolution would read that report number RFDC 09-2020 dated November 16th regarding the options relating to filling the vacancy of the office for one councillor position for Ward 2 be received and that the clerk be given direction that the vacancy for, of the office for one councillor position for Ward 2 for the remainder of the 2018-2022 term of council be filled through option 1A as detailed herein. Option 1A being appointment of the third place candidate, Shelley Ann Braderick. Um, thank Enough. you, Madam Clerk. Any further questions from members of committee? And I see Council Riley, just quickly, if we could, please. Yes, uh, and I have no problem moving that, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the uh, two other little things is one is um, because you mentioned something about not knowing, you know, what the, the next election is going to look like. And I think that's also something else is on my mind, you know, the 30, 25 to $30,000 estimation um, of how this, what this could potentially cost, likely more we is going to wipe out our reserve and we're probably not even thinking this far ahead yet but we also don't know what the next election is going to cost and there might be a requirement to spend even more money than our normal considering the circumstance we're in and what stage we are at that point hopefully covid's gone and within the year but you know that doesn't seem realistic um the other thing i think it's worth noting is you know shelly did reach out so i think this is actually a really good one to endorse because we are it's not a matter of just guessing that the runner-up might be interested we already know that she sent her intent that she would be interested so this here feels like it's the most efficient one of it all so that being said that's i just wanted to mention and i have no problem moving this thank you councillor trombetta final time. Mr. Chair, I think Council Riley answered the question. I know we saw it on the agenda that she was interested. I, I'm taking that she still is interested up to up to this point. Uh, I guess there's nothing that's unheard of up to this point, I guess. She's still interested. All right, very good then. All right. It was moved by Council Riley and seconded by Council Ganan. All those in favor of option 1A. And it carries. I was a little slow there, Council Yonker, but uh, we already had enough. Okay, other business. Item A49 20 members of committee, verbal updates from members of boards or committees, if required. Is there anybody here who wish to speak on that? Council Ganan. Thank you. I didn't think, Chief, that it was worth pulling your report for that, but I want to say that I was very pleased to see that they um, had gone out to find out what was going on and, and the, uh, for the station two, the build of station two. Um, because we don't meet, because we don't see people, I hadn't been really able to check to see what stage we were at with that. So I just want you to know I was happy to see in your report that station two has, the process has begun. So Very good. Very good. Uh, Council Riley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to mention, um, I sit on the, uh, the Santa Claus Parade Committee and I just wanted to mention that uh, as of right now, the Parade Committee just updated like what the, the contest details are. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, the light and decor uh, contest that is gonna be taking place in lieu of the, the parade this year um, is underway and people can go to the, the website there. And I just thought that was worth mentioning. I did also want to mention, um, for those of you who, who realized back when the parade committee had to make the difficult decision to, um, not go forward with the parade, they certainly got their fair share of backlash. And I, I think it's important to bring up to the, 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 bring to attention now that 
this is what they were worrying about this situation that we're in right now. And so again, I think not enough credit is being given to the committee for having the being proactive and foresight of, and being prepared and looking out for the community's best interest and not having a parade this year. It sucks. We all agreed. It would be certainly not a situation any of us wanted to be in, especially with the members who joined, they, they could join with the mindset that they were excited to put on a parade. And when the reality kicked in that it wasn't possibly going to be a reality and not wanting to spend time and waste resource and preparing for something that would very likely be canceled you know if Councilor Trombetta is correct if if what he says is correct it, which it looks a, to be that way uh we're going to be in red next week which would have meant the parade would have been canceled there's no way we could have been in compliance so I just wanted to you know um bring that to attention that the parade committee made the right call and uh, took a lot of heat for it but they made the right call and I think people are realizing that you know the West Lincoln Parade Committee got it right so I thought that was worth uh paying some kudos as well as mentioning the contest that's underway now in, in lieu of the uh, parade. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Mayor. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you, uh, Council Riley. And, and it, you're right, it, it is really rotten that they, they got some backlash because they are just volunteers trying to do the best thing. And, and it's just, just unfortunate. And, and I think there's a certain tension in our community. And I think it's a little bit hotter in other communities. I am very pleased, with, with generally speaking, with the, um, the temperament of our community. And I think that's because we do have opportunities to release, go for walks and enjoy uh, you know, what was a beautiful fall and a couple of really, really warm weeks, uh, even in November. Um, so uh, moving on from that, um, just to, um, two, two things uh, that I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, the, uh, the first is um, kind of a, like an update uh, on West Lincoln Memorial Hospital and the regional components. So I, I wanted to, the counselors here to know that that's going very, very well. Um, uh, the region's coming up with a policy to determine uh, percentages of contribution for the various hospitals in the entire region. And I think we have five or six uh, to, to a certain degree or not. And, and, and uh, so they're developing a policy, which, um, you know, West Lincoln Memorial Hospital is kind of uh, initiating. St. Catharines did get some funds from the region. Uh, now they're, they're saying this is going to be par for the course for all hospital builds in the region. And so we, they're determining that policy. And uh, that's going to be um, uh, voted on. It's already gone through committee. It'll be voted on on Thursday. So just to highlight, if you guys want to uh, jump into the um, um, uh, regional council meeting and, and just see how that discussion going, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, so we're making progress on that front. The other thing that I want to say uh, is uh, uh, the uh, Silverdale Hall has, uh, you know, they're just you know, irrepressible. They, they just are so determined to continue to touch base with their community. Uh, they plan to do another drive-by uh, Christmas uh, event and, and uh, you know, they're, they're in discussions with uh, township staff um, uh, to make sure that's done safely as they have done all summer long, uh, spring and summer. And, um, and so that, that event has been going on for years and years and the proceeds from that event go to community care as they've done for many, many years. Um, I, I, it is again, bittersweet, uh, last year, it is something spectacular to sit shoulder to shoulder, literally shoulder to shoulder with all your neighbors in the Silverdale area. Uh, Councilor Ganan has been there. Um, uh, others have been there. It is, it is a, uh, you know, a, a snug, a snug venue. Uh, there's lots of food and it's cozy. Unfortunately, it's, it's a disaster in these COVID days. Um, so they're doing a, a, a drive by and I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, what good work they've done and, and, and the amount of monies that they've raised, um, uh, continue to raise all through the year in spite of COVID. And, and that's just through the sheer determination of the board and, and, and particularly uh, um, uh, Mrs. Chris Frere. And, um, and uh, just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention here. So keep in mind or keep, keep an eye out for that uh, uh, drive-by opportunity um, uh, at the Silverdale Hall. Thank you. Councilor Trumbetta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just something that came to me a couple weeks ago, and I forgot to bring it, I guess, at uh, last week's at planning. Uh, the mayor knows about it, and so does uh, Councilor Wittaveen, is that Enwick uh, acquired Last Mile Internet uh, Corporation, which is to cause the doubling down its commitment to providing superior broadband services across Niagara. Um, so just a little statement here. Enwick is offering business with dedicated connectivity to symmetrical connections up to one gigabyte per second and will continue the coverage 
uh, to more local, re more local locations in the region. Enwick is investing uh, into its latest wireless technology for home, bringing new unprecedented speed to rural communities of Niagara. And I think this is a big thing. I had a resident even come to my house on Saturday and still not aware of where to go get proper internet. And I, I you know, encouraged them to go to Enwick. You know, Anwick is a great company. It's providing a lot of internet services to rural, and I, I, that's why I, I, I've been obviously using because I'm doing my meetings, and now everybody working from home. You know, the the thing about Anwick is what I don't understand is they don't advertise so much, and a lot of people don't know about it. But uh, if you just spread the word to some of the rural the guys that are in the rural area that Anwick is a good uh, company, and it uh, does provide unlimited internet for homes and uh, quick service. So. Thought it was a good news story for the region of Niagara and obviously us in West Lincoln. So I just wanted to bring that uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trombetta. Any further? Seeing none, moving on to- oh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, sorry. Yes, Councillor Yonker. I would just like to remind everybody about the uh, toys uh, for, Toonies for Toys. Definitely keep that in your thoughts. Make sure you're carrying lots of chains wherever you're going and uh, continue donating into the bottles. And um, hopefully we can have a good result there as well for the right. West Lincoln Chamber of Commerce and Community Care. Very good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Item A50-20, members of council, other business of an informative nature? Seeing none, new business, only items require immediate attention or direction must first prove a motion to introduce a new item of business. Council Riley, do you have one this week? No, I can, I can probably come up with one real quick. Oh, I can tell my the mayor look on the mayor's face and he was expecting it. So I had to say it. So I, but, but okay, this, no, one, okay. this, is, a, this is a clean one, this one. All right. So that's the end of that one. There are no confidential matters tonight. So the meeting is now adjourned at the hour of 8.22 PM. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening. Thank you.